But anyway, praise the Lord. Um, it's, it's a really nice situation that we have to do it. Now, let me just say, all for, I haven't started preaching yet, by the way. We're getting there. Just warming up to it. I'm just warming up to it. Um, is that uh, I believe in Sunday night church. I love Sunday night church. Remember, I was, I was, with, um, I was, I was brought up in an Anglican church and it was John Chapman, who was Canon John Chapman of Sydney, came, came and spoke in uh, this, this little Anglican church that I went to and, and he extolled the virtues of Sunday night church. And so my parents started going Sunday night church and, and I was probably 13 then. And I, I don't reckon I've ever not gone Sunday night church, just for the rest of my life, just, just ticked along. I really, really enjoy Sunday night church. So... I just wanted you to know that. And I wanted you to know that if I wasn't preaching, if I wasn't a pastor, I'd be in church Sunday night. I would, quite genuinely. That's just a by the way. I think it's an important by the way. Because the other week, for example, I was speaking at a church, another church, Sunday night. And then when they told me that it wasn't until 7 o'clock, I thought, beauty, I get to go to my own church. I can just sit in my own church. I can be a part of, I can be supporting what's happening Sunday night. I thought, that's great. So I'm a true believer in this. I was talking with a pastor who who said that he had uh, another pastor on staff who left the staff position. So he was no longer a staff pastor in the church. And when this staff pastor was up at the pulpit and was, you know, he, he, would, he would whip the people into coming Sunday nights and, and coming to the prayer meetings and doing all that. And, and, and this senior pastor was saying to me, now that he's not a staff pastor, we don't see him Sunday nights and we don't see him at the prayer meetings. And I actually think that's pretty that's marshmallow. Let's, let's digest some of this. Father, we thank you that you're able to speak to us in a way that is very practical. We thank you, Lord, that you're able to take your word and take it from ink on pages to becoming reality in our hearts. So tonight, Lord, as we look at your word, I pray that it will enter our hearts and that, Lord, we will not only do what your word says, but we will be who your word says. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn to the last chapter of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. We're going to read the last two verses of the second paragraph and then look at at how uh, Paul finishes off this epistle so that we can understand in conclusion exactly what Paul wanted to say to the churches of Galatia. Now, you know, just as a by the way, I find that a really interesting point that in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 2, he's writing to churches. Really fascinating. Somebody said to me, well, there's really only one church. Yeah, but you know, biblically, the local church is a church. I mean, let that thought sink into your head for a minute. The local church is a church. The local church is precious in the eyes of God. The local church, the local gathering of believers is a group of people that God has ordained and and God wants to speak to. And Paul is speaking to all of them in that region, the churches of Galatia. So here we go. Having looked at what Paul has said, we're going to see that he concludes with a bit of a summary of of really what he was trying to get at. But we're going to start Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Now, I've got this one highlighted in my Bible because this is precious to me. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Let's skip verse 10 because I want to come back to that and go to verse 11. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Now chances are some scholars believe that Paul had like a secretary who wrote down, you know, everything that he said to be written down. And then the way he authenticated these epistles was he actually took the stylus and he wrote. And they recognised his handwriting. And that's the point he's making here. He's writing large letters. Not that this is a long epistle, it's just that he wrote big because his eyes were failing him. Verse 12, It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised 
and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus, the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. You know, I guess we could sum up what Paul is saying there in, that, in, in those concluding remarks of saying this. If you think outward external form, if you think that looking the part means that your heart has been changed, you may not necessarily be right. And... When we consider what Christianity is really all about, Paul says it's not about what you do in your flesh. It's not about what you say. It's not about what others think. It's about what's on the inside. It's about whether you're a new creation, he says, a new creation. Have you been changed on the inside? Now, in essence, Paul's argument through Galatians is this, that you can't do that. You can't, you can't do a, an extreme makeover and make yourself a Christian. You can't do a home renovation and take yourself from being a bad person to being a good person and think that that's what it's about. He said that's in essence what these people who, who want to make you into law-abiding Christians, people who just get circumcised, who look the part, that's really what they're about. You know, as Christians, we've got to draw the principles of this. And the principles include, you know, there may be people who look rough around the edges. They may be people who don't look like nice Christians. But you know what? Their hearts could be hearts of gold. Their hearts could be so redeemed. Their hearts could be so on fire for God. But man, the words don't come out right. The things they do are a little bit clumsy, a little bit awkward. They still bring in some of the baggage of the world with them. They're still doing things that, that maybe aren't completely compatible with what, you know, a spirit-filled, empowered believer should be doing. But yet something has begun on the inside. Thank God that we're a work in progress. Thank God. Thank God that when he got a hold of you, he doesn't want to press the pause button. He wants us to continue to walk with him. He wants us to be a work in progress. You know, I heard somebody say to me recently, they were speaking of somebody, they said, oh, I've known this person 30 years, and you know, they haven't changed a bit. And I thought, oh, dear God, I hope nobody says that of me. I hope there are people here who, who can look at me over the last 12 or so years that we've been in this church and can go, Wow, you're different than when you first came. Boy, are you different. Man, even in the last 12 months you're different. In the last whatever, you're a work in progress. And that is a new creation. God is creating us into somebody that we are yet to be. And I think that's great news. You know, when we talk about people that are hard to get along with, sometimes we think of the druggies, we think of the, the dysfunctional people, we think of the people with hang-ups, we think of all these people. What about the people Paul was really, really concerned about, the legalists? You know, sometimes as Christians, we shoot our wounded. We don't heal our wounded. You know, some of the most wounded people I know are people who are caught up in a works mentality. They beat themselves senseless. I... Um, I, I usually, it's my habit to get a, a, a sleep Sunday afternoons because normally after Sunday morning I'm just flogged and I like to have a bit of a break and, and I made sure that I was, and we went out for lunch and we, we, I was the first one to get home so I could just really hit that pillow and just grab a few Z's before tonight and as soon as I, as soon as my head hit the pillow the phone rang 
So I thought, oh, brother, it's probably Kim. She's probably locked her keys in the car again or something. And so, so I, I grabbed the phone. Yeah, and it was uh, somebody I hadn't spoken to for a long time, an old friend. And he began to, he began to um, ask me how my trip was. And I thought, yeah, okay, this is going somewhere. But I'll, I'll just do the small talk thing. So I did the small talk thing. Not that it's a thing. It's just the process you go to and go through. And, and I said, and how are you going? And he said, well, well, I'm struggling a bit. I said, why? He said, it's mum. You know how my dad died a slow, painful death of cancer? And then it was shortly after that that mum cracked her neck and has been debilitated with a spinal injury for all of her life since then, has had numerous surgeries to try and rectify it. It's just made it worse. And, and you know how she remarried and remarried a guy. The moment she married him, he just turned out to be less than honourable and, and you know how he recently died adding to the weight of misery my mum's had throughout her life well last week my mum was diagnosed with kidney cancer and he said to me where's God I've been in a church all my life I've been told that if I, if I was a good boy if I did everything right God would just honour and bless and everything would work out fine and he said, where is he? I've prayed for 35 years for my mum to get well. For 35 years I've been praying that mum's situation would turn around. And it's just got worse and worse and worse. Where's God? <laughs> you know, as, as uh, I listened to my really good friend share this, um, he, he said, you know, because I've been told that if I did this, God would do this. And I said to him, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. There's nothing we can do that forces God to do anything. But that might be the bad news. Here's the good news. God is still a good God and a God of grace. And no matter what happens, God is a good God. And I think here's, here's a really good friend of mine who's, who, who has been infected with this works legalistic mentality. Not, not as worse, as bad as I've been. Not as bad as some still are. But you know, we worship God not for what we can get. We serve God not for what we can get. I started to watch a show on TV last night and I gave up because I just ran out of puff to watch it called um, Civil Action with John Travolta. If you saw the end of it, please tell me how it ended. <laughs> but they, they, they were going through a really hard time financially. With, with, they were up against this small legal firms, up against these huge legal firms. And the huge legal firms are just drawing out the process so that the small legal firm will eventually run out of money, which they did. But they bluffed their way through it. They didn't tell anyone. And the guy got so desperate, the financial controller of this small legal firm got so desperate, he was buying lottery tickets, <laughs> he, was, he mortgaged his house, he mortgaged his boss's house without telling him. He, he then late, one late night, because he, he had to sack the secretary because he couldn't afford the secretary anymore, he's answering his own phones. One late night he had the TV on, there's a television evangelist there saying, you send $200 and God will pour a blessing into your life. And so he turns up the next morning and he's talking to his bank manager as he's trying to get a loan. He says, I've been so desperate, I even gave the television evangelist $200 I didn't have. And it's still not working. And you know, some people have got this works mentality that is just crippling them and their understanding of God and their relationship with God. And here's somebody who was so desperate, they tried to manipulate God. And Paul condemns that in Galatians, absolutely condemns it. And I guess this could cause some of us to wonder, well, what's the point in doing anything that looks good? What's the point in coming to church, giving our offerings? What's the point in trying to live a good Christian life, be a nice person? What's the point if God's not going to come through? 
Well, firstly, can I say, that was never the point. That was never the point. And Paul makes that clear, that the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit, not the stuff you've got to work on. It's the stuff that just comes out of your life because your life is being changed. Your life is being renewed. So let's clear that one up for a start. Now let's come to this verse that I skipped. This is a powerful verse. And let's see if we can unpack it and get a hold of it. And in essence, this is what I really want to say. Verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's unpack that for a moment. And the way we unpack that is to make sure that we know what the text says. So what does the text actually say? Well, it's pretty clear. As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Well, let's answer the question, what is the household of faith? Now, I'm intrigued that Paul, this is believed to be his first epistle. His first epistle. And in his first epistle, he brings in this term, the household of faith. Well, I did a scan of the entire scripture looking for where else this expression occurs, and it doesn't. So I'm intrigued by this. Because I, if, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do anything with this verse, I've got to know what he means. What does he mean, the household of faith? What does he mean by that? <clears throat> How can we understand what Paul is getting at when he talks about a household of faith? What could he be talking to? I'd like you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8. You know the New Testament is arranged to churches first, then to people. And we're going 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. I want you to have a look at this because Paul uses a similar expression, although not an exact expression, here in, in this verse. It says this, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for the members of his household. He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The old King James has worse than an infidel, an unbeliever. Look what Paul's saying here. Because it's a very similar thought to Galatians 6.10. Very similar thought. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Well, what does Paul mean by this household of faith here? Clearly, it seems he's talking about the family unit. That's what it seems to refer to. The household of faith is a faith-filled household, a household of faith, a household where there are uh, family members who are believers. That seems to be what Paul is saying here. And Paul is saying, you know, well, if we can extrapolate from what Paul is saying here, I guess we could, we could make it mean something like this. If you think your task is to go off and save the world and change the world and do all you can for the world and your own kids, your own wife or your own husband is being neglected because of your global mission, you're worse than an unbeliever. Oh, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? I wonder how different the church would look if within homes we got some of this stuff right. It's an interesting thought. So here's a question. Providing for your family members. What does that mean? This might be an interesting question to ask in your particular families. What do you want from each other? How can I, in my family, provide for my family? How can I provide for my wife? How can I provide for my children? It's an interesting question. I think it deserves asking and I think it deserves answering and I think it deserves something where, where 
each member of the household can maybe contribute. I appreciate the fact that my children are learning to be assertive. I really do. And assertiveness is just really saying where you're at, what you think, what you feel in a, in a polite way, which is different to being aggressive. Aggressive is just forcing your own way. So, little, little, not so little, Zoe is assertive. She goes to bed, she lies on her bed, and she says, Daddy, I want a hug. <laughs> so Dad comes in and gives her a hug. Tyrone, on the other hand, <laughs> says, when I say, Tyrone, I'm coming into your room, he goes, no, don't! <laughs> and so I'm meeting a need that he's got, a need for no discipline. <laughs> and there are certain ways we can meet the needs within our own household. Well, let's come back to Galatians 6.10, because I don't think that's exactly what Paul is referring to here. But it is a household of faith. So I find it interesting that Paul is using this term household, which really is another word for family, home. But yet I don't think he's meaning the home, the family unit in this context. It appears to me that he's referring to the church. It appears to me that he's talking about those who are of the household of faith being fellow believers. That, that's how it appears to me to be. It's, you know, it's, I'm not trying to be too mystical about this. That's what it appears to be. So here's the thought. Isn't it interesting that he calls the church a family? Isn't that interesting? I mean, maybe it's not. Maybe you just take that for granted. But, you know, there is a real push to make the church a business, a corporation, an organisation, and there's all the emphases, emphases that come with getting those things right that diminish what Paul is actually saying here. We're a family. But I wonder if that is all he's saying, because it's not. If you have a look at it, he's actually saying in this verse, now mind you, this is the closing thoughts of his epistle. And they're usually pretty important. He says this, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Think about this. He's writing to the church and he's saying, church, do good to everyone. You know, and I, I just thought about that and I, I'm praying, God, how do we live that out? As a church, how do we live that out? As modern, contemporary Christians, how do we live that out? You know, the, the, the thing that, 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 I, that I sense God is saying is that for us to do good to everyone means that we make a difference in this world. We make a difference in a way that might seem small, but it's enough to set off a chain, a trigger. It just triggers a whole chain of events. Being nice. Being nice. Doing good. Then I come to the last part of this where he says, but especially be good. Especially do good to the household of faith. And I've got to say, this was the verse that triggered the decision that Kim and I had to make when it came to a certain commercial decision we had to make. I thought, yeah, we could channel our money for this particular thing that we need doing to anybody. But it says but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Do good. So we decided to find a competent Christian business person who could do what we were after. Competent Christian. So let's just pause there with that thought. Competent Christian. Have you ever met somebody who is a Christian businessman and the emphasis is on Christian rather than businessman. In other words, they assume you'll do business with them because they are Christian rather than because they're good at what they do. I have. 
and I learned very soon that I shouldn't have because they weren't a competent Christian business person. So let's flip the thing a bit, flip the tables a bit. How about you? What you do? Where you work, where you serve, what you do. Are you doing it for the Lord? Are you doing it competently? Are you doing it as unto the Lord? Are you doing it so that it deserves the support of your fellow household of faith members? hope so. In fact, that's what I believe God would have us do. So, why do I hear testimonies from people who do business with Christians and the testimony goes something like this. You know, I don't think I'm ever going to do business with Christians again because they don't pay their bills on time, if they pay at all. They always screw me down for the last cent to get a super discount and the, they don't come through on their part of the deal. I hear that too often and I don't want to hear that said of anybody in this church. Do good to everybody, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Do you know what that looks like? It looks like if you know someone who's a Christian businessman and they're competent Christian businessmen, the first question you you, you, you don't ask this. This is not the first question to ask. So what discount do I get? I see here, do good to them. You know what that sounds like? Bless them. Bless them. Now, I'm not saying you should allow yourself to get ripped off or you know, be taken advantage of, but I'm wondering if we can't change the flavour of our society by being Christians <laughs> who are prepared to bless people who are out there having a go. Bless them. Bless them. You know, we ser- Kim and I served under a pastor when I was um, a youth pastor and, and uh, he, said, he said to me, whenever you go into a Christian bookstore and the Christian bookstore find out you're a pastor and they offer you a discount, don't accept it. Don't, and especially don't ask for a discount. Pay the price that everybody else is going to pay. Bless them. Bob Smith, he was a great man. He's a great man. And that's what he said. And you know, all too often I hear people say to me, oh, you should do business with such and such. They're a Christian. They'll probably give you a better price. As if it's okay to rip off another Christian brother or sister. (laughs) And I just don't think that's right. I don't think that's what Paul is saying here. Do good especially to those who have the household of faith. I'm stressing here that it doesn't mean we engage in business with people who are Christians, allowing ourselves to be ripped off or do something wrong or unfair or whatever. That, that's not what I'm saying. But like, for example, we have got several medical people in this church. You know, I actually think it's unfair... It's unfair... Now, I don't know of anybody who's done this, by the way... So listen to me, I'm not trying to bash anybody up here and I hope I haven't done it and if I have, they can correct me. But I actually think it's unfair to take advantage of a professional Christian's profession without engaging them commercially. You know what I mean? It's like going up to one of the doctors in this church and going, you know, I've had this terrible sort of pussy thing on my... (laughs) on my buttock. (laughs) Could you just take a quick look at it and tell me what's going on? Can I tell you, I don't think that's what Paul meant when he said do good to everyone, especially to the household of faith. (laughs) But you know what doing good might look like? It might look like making an appointment, seeing and paying for that. That's what it might look like. 
It's a different mentality. Now, for those of us that were brought up by parents who survived the Great Depression or came through, you know, with grandparents who say, oh, I remember when we had to milk the cows by 4 a.m., <laughs> catch them first, milk them, directly into the milk bottles, directly put the silver foil on the milk bottle and carry each bottle individually to the dairy. Then we had to go back and, you know, all these sort of stories. For, the, for those people who've got this stingy, pathetic sort of life is always going to be tough mentality, this might be a really hard concept to think of blessing someone, doing good for someone. And I hope that's not any of us. Doing good. It, it, it could be that you see your neighbour struggling with their mowing. You know, they just haven't had time, their mower might be broken, and you mow their lawns. It could be that you see your local school uh, needs a, a really good tidy up, which is exactly what Danny Guglamucci and his church did in Adelaide uh, three, four years ago. And they mustered the whole church in one day, just came and did a complete renovation of their local high school at, at no cost to the school just gave her their time and their resources. It's a different mentality. So let's, let's come back as we wrap this up. Here we find Paul saying, don't give up doing good, verse 9. And do good, keep doing good, as a, but a, do good to everyone, but especially to your brothers and sisters, especially to them. And then he finishes off this epistle saying, don't think that just looking good means you are. Let's pray. Father, help us to be a people who are born of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, people of a changed heart, a changed mind, a changed attitude. Help us to be a people, Lord, who look to bless somebody. Help us to be Psalm 15 people, people who look to bless and to do good to others. Lord, I pray for those within the sound of my voice and perhaps they have been hurt or disappointed or let down by perhaps somebody who's professed to be a Christian. Lord, I, I can't begin to apologise enough on their behalf and I don't know if that would carry any weight or significance at all. But Lord, I do know this, that we can from this point, from this day, decide that we are going to be a people who will do good and especially to our brothers and sisters, that we will be a people of blessing, not looking to take advantage of our brothers or sisters, but, Lord, looking to bless our brothers or sisters. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to be the people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.